demand viewing on YouTube channel. If you don't wish to be recorded, please leave the meeting and you'll be able to watch it later. We have enabled a chat function for you so you can ask questions of our speakers, which our MCs will then put to the speakers. And can you please make sure that you stick to the subject, uh, uh, the topic of the, of the speaker. If you have any problems or technical difficulties, put it in the chat line and, and Natanya and myself we will be looking at it and try to fix it as soon as we can. But please beware, this is our first virtual uh, conference. Uh, we are amateurs, we are volunteers, and we're trying to do it the best way we can. So be patient with us, please. For now for, to go further on, I would like to welcome all our guests. Uh, we have got guests from the UK, USA, Uganda, New Zealand, Australia, or worldwide today. And I'd like to welcome the REM committee. Uh, if the REM committee could leave the video on for a few minutes so people can see who they are, that'd be very nice indeed. I got a special acknowledgement also for uh, Dr. Jenny Carrison and Gloria uh, Hargraves and, and Jenny Lim. These three people have helped enormously to get this virtual conference, RAM conference happening. Um, thank you so much. Without you guys, I couldn't have done this. Um, saying I'm only a new kid on the block and I'm trying to do the best I can. I also like to acknowledge the, all the road directors who have been involved in making this happening. I'd like to uh, say thank you to the MC we had yesterday, uh, Nat. And today I'd like to say thank you to Sarah who is uh, joining us as, a, as an MC. Please uh, stay uh, online and, and enjoy the all oh, so she knows I'm there. She, whoever is there, Gloria, can you go on mute, please? Um, <laughs> whoever is not on mute, please go on mute. And I'd like to throw over now to our MC for the day, uh, Sarah Jacobs, who will keep us all entertained for the rest of the morning with speakers and other things that are happening. Over to you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I would like to make an acknowledgement to country. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Committee of Rotarians Against Malaria, RAM, acknowledges the traditional custodians of our con of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. So I'll first go into introducing Steve Carroll, our first speaker today, who will be as, um, talking via a video link. Steve joined the Army at 18 and saw active service in Malaya, British North Borneo, Vietnam, and served 12 months in Papua New Guinea. Steve, just make sure you're on mute if you're not on mute as <laughs> ever. Steve contracted malaria twice during his service, Felicipurum um, from Malaya and Vivax while in PNG. Sadly, in 1989, they lost their daughter, Michelle, to colloquium um, resistant malaria. And after a period of seclusion, he and wife Doreen decided to dedicate their lives to reducing the toll of malaria in 2015, Steve became the District 9670 RAM Chair and together have raised and contributed over $80,000 for malaria projects throughout their region. They have visited PNG, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. In 2015, Steve and Doreen organised a motorcycle ride around Australia that raised $28,000. Today, he will be talking about Mozzies Do Kill Aussies. Please welcome Steve Carroll. Our story began in 1989 when our daughter Michelle was 18. 
18 years of age. Uh, so in August of 1989, we uh, landed in Kota Kinabalu, the capital of uh, North Borneo, or Sabah as it is now, and uh, went off on a uh, tour of a lifetime. Probably the first thing that we did was to be taken to a set of caves where the people were harvesting birds' nests to make soup. We absolutely uh, were astounded by, by these caves where we spent the night with the people uh, celebrating, singing, drinking their local brew and um, then back uh, to Kota Kinabalu. Then uh, we were off to uh, Sandakan um, where the orangutan rehabilitation centre is. Going through that was a revelation in itself. Michelle was over the moon uh, watching these young things being rehabilitated uh, and then being sent back out into the bush. From Sandakan we also went off onto a uh, little island there that was called the Turtle Islands. We watched uh, turtles being hatched um, of the night time and set back free. That followed uh, back to uh, uh, Kota Kinabalu by plane and we went uh, on probably what was to be the uh, pinnacle of the trip. We went to climb Mount Kinabalu, the highest mountain in Southeast Asia. And uh, Michelle was rather taken with the idea of doing what Dad had done and being a mountaineer. So the climb uh, took us uh, two days uh, to get up to the top stage and then I was too uh, weak by that stage but Michelle went on and went up to the top and came back. Everything was abs going absolutely perfect, what you would call the perfect holiday. So having uh, finished our mountain climb, we were, uh, went down to the bottom back to Ranau where the death march had actually finished, um, said our prayers to the uh, memorials there. And from there it was uh, flying back to Singapore where I hired a car and we started on our journey around Malaya, uh, Malay Peninsula, from Singapore up to Malacca and then on to Penang, where I had lived during my service uh, over there, up a little bit north until we got to the northernmost uh, county and that was called um, Kwantan. It's up near the Thailand border and we booked into a uh, nice five-star hotel, settled down, went to dinner, and halfway through dinner, Michelle left her food and started to look a little bit queasy. Naturally, we thought it was um, what you might say, you know, barley belly or something. Um, about 10 o'clock that night, Michelle started to complain about aches in her legs, and she was getting a headache. Uh, we gave her some aspirin and uh, settled her down. But uh, somewhere around midnight, uh, she wake, wake, woke me and uh, said the pains in her legs were getting worse and worse. Uh, but by five o'clock in the morning, um, she was in quite a lot of pain, uh, more headaches. And at that stage, I too uh, was starting to show the same symptoms. Not so much the leg pains, but the headache um, and a feeling of uh, just being like a bad case of flu. They, about nine o'clock um, it was before a doctor came and he was not um, very forthcoming in his, uh, let's say, diagnosis. He um, I'd said... Um, that she should uh, have some more painkillers. About 11 o'clock, um, Michelle was obviously getting worse and I was starting to um, lose interest in my surroundings. Uh, 
Chris uh, said this is no good whatsoever and uh, decided to ring the insurance company that uh, we'd taken out our insurance with. Um, but again, this took a couple of hours to get anything done. They then sent an ambulance around to the um, hotel and took Michelle to the local hospital. We got a phone call in from the local hospital that afternoon to say that they um, felt that she could possibly have malaria um, and that they would have to buy drugs. Uh, our response was, particularly Chris's response, she being a nurse and me being crook, um, she said, look, you know, just give her the drugs and let's get on with things. Uh, to that they replied, but we don't have any because we don't have malaria in Malaya anymore. Um, by the time the next morning came around, uh, Chris went to the hospital where she found Michelle to be in a very, very serious state, um, contacted the uh, people back in Australia once again um, and uh, she insisted that something else be done. Okay, a little later that day, um, the emergency uh, aeroplane, the um, evacuation plane arrived. It was a Learjet um, air ambulance came up from Singapore. So uh, they loaded uh, Michelle into that, intubated her and uh, wheeled me out and put me in with her. I don't remember much of the flight on the plane, but I do remember landing in Singapore, being loaded into an ambulance and driven to Mount Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, both Michelle and I were put immediately into um, ICU, intensive care unit. Um, and I was uh, interviewed by the um, doctor in charge of tropical medicine for the, um, Singapore. His name was Dr. Go. By that stage, um, I had been given a drug, uh, an anti-malarial drug, which I think was mefloquine, and uh, I had started to recover almost immediately. At least I had my senses back. And Dr. Go uh, told me that we were both suffering from two types of malaria, um, both Vivax and Falciparum. I can't remember a great deal of that day, um, except that I know um, word had been sent back to Australia to uh, my wife, Doreen, that uh, we were in trouble. Uh, it was probably another 24 hours before I got any inkling again of what was happening. Um, I was, I was then taken out of intensive care and put into a recovery room and allowed to see Michelle. What I saw shocked me. She was intubated uh, so much. She had so many things hanging out of her that, um, you know, it was an absolute shock. I was then told uh, that she was in a very, very serious state and there was not a great deal of hope that she would recover. We came across a uh, problem. The doctors told us that um, one of the symptoms of malaria was that she was losing all of her platelets, uh, therefore subject to uh, bleeding and needed them replaced. Obviously, uh, we both said that we would uh, give as much blood as we possibly could. Um, but unfortunately, they wouldn't take mine because they said I was infected. Um, and um, I'm, not, I'm not sure why they wouldn't take Doreen's. And there was a short reach of uh, blood because Asians can't give a great deal of blood being so slight. By this stage, I'd been released from the hospital and 
um, to try to get blood. I went out into the streets of Singapore, outside the hospital, and stopping every European I could find, asking them would they go in and give blood. The only people who responded to that, strangely enough, came from Newcastle, New South Wales. They were a couple of merchant seamen from uh, Newcastle. When we uh, left Brisbane Airport to uh, go on our trip, we took out a uh, standard insurance policy uh, which gave us a million dollars medical cover. One would have thought at that time that that was plenty of money to cover the, everything. Unfortunately, what we uh, found then, uh, while still in the hospital in uh, Singapore, they came to us and said, you're getting short of money uh, from the insurance company. The evacuation flight from Kwantan to Singapore had cost a quarter of a million dollars and uh, intensive care was costing $10,000 per day. In the meantime, um, I was told that uh, by the doctors that the only hope Michelle had of uh, living would be to get her back to Australia. There was nothing more they could do in Singapore. The um, emergency assist people again uh, came to my assistance. They were on the telephone to me every day. A woman whose only name I knew was Heather uh, rang me every day and kept me up to date with things, encouraging me. And she was able to get two intensivists from Australia to fly over and um, we got a uh, booking to get back to Australia by Qantas. Uh, but we were able to get onto a Qantas flight. The sad part of that was that they asked us or insisted that we pay for 16 seats on the plane. Um, that was the seats that we would take up, the two doctors and myself. Michelle was on the wall on a stretcher. So we flew back to Australia. She was admitted to a hospital in Brisbane. And after quite a long time um, in intensive care there, um, the doctors called us in and told us that um, if she had another episode, they would not revive her. And that uh, is what happened. Um, Unfortunately, uh, there was nothing further they can do and she passed away. Uh, and so if you um, were to look up the um, internet and ask um, how many cases of malaria deaths are there in Australia, you'll be told none. Um, if, you, if you look back across and say, you know, how long since, they'll say there are none. How many cases of malaria in Australia? Well, last year, the official record is 470 cases. However, um, those cases were all uh, acquired overseas and brought back to Australia. Um, no deaths. These figures are not correct. There are many, many deaths, Australian deaths from malaria. Not in Australia, they happen overseas. They're not recorded as dying from malaria. They're recorded as dying from ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, uh, pneumonia, blood loss, organ failure. Mo most of these countries don't want people to know that they have a disease that can kill tourists. In 1990, um, we joined Rotary in uh, Port Hedland in Western Australia where we had moved. The first thing when I was asked in Rotary, what do you want to do in Rotary or what do you wish to get out of it? I said, I want to destroy malaria. As soon as I realised that there was a Rotary program to fight malaria, I said, we're into this. And with the help of some of my friends, we decided that um, we needed some money to do it. 
So we organised a motorcycle ride around Australia to try to raise enough money to do something about malaria. And to help me with uh, this project, we, I was very, very lucky enough to get two blokes who were uh, just as dedicated as me, not so much to malaria, but to any good cause. Uh, Doreen and I um, accompanied them, but not on motorcycles. We had a support vehicle with a trailer behind us. We started off in uh, 2015, uh, in April, and went for 50 odd days, nearly two months, dry, riding around Australia, talking to uh, Rotaries, Lions, RSL, clubs, anyone else who would listen, trying to get onto media, telling people about the um, problems of malaria, the world toll, and that they are not safe, and trying to raise funds. We did, in fact, raise $28,000. So that then allowed us to uh, have enough money to start off uh, uh, on some projects, which we're still working on now. What I want to say to you now is Mozzies do kill Aussies. So what I'm saying is don't let this happen to you or someone you love or someone you know. Anyone that's going over to a country where malaria is, get on to them. Tell them to take these precautions. Tell them that they are not safe. Just because you're an Australian doesn't mean that you are mozzie proof. Very touching story that one was. Thank you, Steve. Uh, now I'll be introducing Dr. El D Dr. Danielle Stanisic. Dr. Danielle Stanisic is an associate research leader at the Institute of Glycomics Griffith University, where she co-leads the malaria vaccine development program with Professor Michael Good. Her PhD research examined the reg regulation of malaria-specific immune responses in rodent models of malaria. Dr. Stanisic's ongoing research involves transitioning whole parasite vaccine candidates from preclinical animal studies to clinical development and their evaluation in clinical trials. This includes the manufacture and evaluation of clinical chemically attenuated malaria vaccine that is completing phase 1b efficacy trials at Griffith University. She'll be talking about the progress of Griffith University malaria's vaccine program. Please welcome Danielle Stanisic. I may. I'm trying to do it ahead of time on budget and with high impact and if I may let me explain what that means. I pulled this cartoon uh, yesterday from the New Yorker, it was in a September um, edition of New Yorker, and it, it's kind of funny um, in a way. Um, mosquito food pyramid, ankles, 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 ankles. And uh, that's great, uh, and most people really are not impacted beyond the nuisance of, uh, of being bitten by a mosquito. But I'll, I'll show you this, which is um, the results of some modeling that was done at Imperial College London for us uh, not that long ago. A four year delay in implementing next generation NETS, insecticide treated NETS, would result in more than 83 million additional malaria cases uh, over the course of 20, between 2023 and 2040, and an additional 166,000 to 277,000 lives lost. So, um, for, for the, most of the world it, it, and, and in your region, it, it, it's a very serious disease. And how do we know all this? We know all this because we, we don't just invent and create technologies uh, and get them in the marketplace. We have to do um, a lot of work to try and understand which, not just which ones, um, but uh, how to layer the technologies with, with drugs and vaccines as, as they come through. Uh, and, and also how to understand what public health impacts they're having, meaning a dollar spent on one technology needs to be uh, have more impact than a dollar, the dollar for the technology it replaces, um, because there really isn't enough of these interventions to go around. There's only so much money 
to pay for them. So um, some very extensive um, modeling does go on uh, in all these communities, in, in all these research areas, but including vector control. And what we're able to do is, is look at a number of scenarios, look at those technologies, look at the Im potential impact when we can deliver them. And just like vaccines, it's a very, very long process for a novel intervention, particularly insecticide. 10 years is, would, would, would be a really good timeline. Uh, and, and we're able to back that out and say, so if we've delayed, um, if there was a delay because we had to do additional studies or we couldn't get funding, what impact is that going to have? So I, I think even if, even if those numbers are out by tenfold uh, or, or fivefold or twofold, they're staggering numbers in terms of, in, in terms of global deaths uh, and you have to take it very seriously. So time to market is very important. So um, I don't know if you can, what, what, what's missing off your screen? I can only see about two thirds of my screen, but I, 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 just to let, so that you um, give you a sense of, of, of the history here, Long lasting nets and indoor residual spraying, which I think you all know about, are really the kind of the foundation, the, 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 the cornerstone of what's been going on in malaria eradication for, um, sorry about my dog barking here. I expect my wife will throttle it any minute. Um, but in, in uh, between 2000 and 2015, 68% um, of malaria cases and around 11% um, um, for IRS, it's 68% for NETS, um, were really averted by NETS and IRS, which is a very big number. Uh, again, it's, it's an estimate, but it, it suggests that, that there's a lot of impact. And that's been partly responsible for this shrinking malaria map, and sorry about the focus on Africa, but that 91% of malaria deaths in 2016 were, were in Africa, and so that's where we're doing a lot of our modeling of impact. Um, but what we do know, what we really do know um, from the World Malaria Reports, progress really has stalled. And we can, we, we can speculate on why it's stalled, but it has stalled and it's continued to stall or stay flat. And, and that is very, very concerning. And insecticide resistance is, is something we know is having an impact. So uh, for those of you who haven't read this report, I would recommend you do. It was published uh, in The Lancet in 2019 and talks about a malaria eradication within a generation, ambitious, ambitious, achievable and necessary. And it, it talks about the need for new vector control tools, that the fact they have saved a lot of lives, but they're becoming less effective. And it calls for a substantial investment in diagnostics, drugs and vector control. Insecticide resistance has to be addressed. And it highlights a, a PDP, an organization like IDCC, where there are new products coming through and those products are having um, quite an impact. So just to show you the impact, we have a, a program across Africa in 16 countries that started in 2016 and is just really has just pulled to an end. And it's actually replacing IRS, uh, some of the older chemistries with the newer chemistries. And it's also using them as, it, as we always do in combination with NETS. So uh, over the course of that four years, we, we, we managed to protect somewhere around 135 million people and saw somewhere between a 22 and 47% drop in cases when we switched to the new technologies. And that actually results in, in, in about 5.6 to about 11 million cases averted. And if you do some crude maths, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, the math has to be crude, it has to be estimates. But that's between 16 and, and, and 33,000 lives saved. So we do know that if you bring the technologies on and you can combat insecticide resistance in these, in these, in these rather crude, but crude but very effective interventions like NETS and IRS, we can have a much bigger impact. So IBCC is a PDP, Product Development Partnership. There are quite a few of us, each one specializing in a disease. I don't have a lot of time to talk about them, but we have a number of funders. It's the US government, the Australian government, um, the, the UK government, Swiss government, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Unitaid and the Global Fund. And those latter two are really about delivering finished products into the marketplace. And PDPs uh, perform a unique uh, role, really. They address market challenges, and we'll talk very briefly about that. And they de-risk innovation, meaning they put money together for expensive research from lots of different organizations and governments and philanthropic sources 
because that's what it's going to take to bring a product to market. Um, at, at least for a single product, probably 250 million. And we also bring together scientists from around the world. I see De Dennis. Uh, I see Dennis on the list. Uh, Dennis is very much involved in IVCC, particularly what we're doing uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And then we we bring sort of business, not rather than academic uh, a viewpoint. We bring a business viewpoint to this, meaning we will how do we kill projects early or select the right projects. And we're not so much focused on 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 the science and publication, but we really try trying to, as quickly as possible, get impact. And then there's a very big education, advocacy, and engagement piece to make sure people are, are, are focused on the, on, the, on the end goal. Um, you folks have probably know that, that the Australian government um, actually supports four of these PDPs, so three including uh, IVCC. So they support FINE, dealing with diagnostics, MNV, the malaria drugs, and the TB Alliance. So we, we, we're fourth in that list, and we're very grateful for the support. So we, we, we've got really four pillars of things we do. Bring new products to market, which is, uh, and, and, and the focus there is to make sure that the, the older interventions are still working, but with new chemistry. And that's a big focus of the, our, our grant from the Australian government. And then removing barriers. And um, you know, one of the things we, we, we do, for example, is to develop field sites across Africa. We have seven two of which we fully fund uh, and, and we're getting all those seven are gradually becoming fully good laboratory practice uh, certified. And that means they can generate data that the regulatory authorities recognize as a high quality. And then to do this, this little piece here, which is maximizing impact is, it's no good developing something if it sits on a shelf, it has to be at a price and a performance uh, and, and availability um, that, that's needed in the marketplace. And this one here, which is very much the focus of why I think we got a, a grant from the Australian government was how do we capitalize on all this work that's been done for Africa to see how it can be applied um, to the Indo-Pacific uh, region uh, and really kind of get, to a certain extent a freebie. How do we, how do we take technologies developed there and see if we can use them elsewhere? So it's really, we've really boiled it down to a few simple things we're trying to do. Uh, and that's essential for eradication. One is to make sure that the proven tools that are out there and have saved millions of lives carry on working. And that means replacing the active ingredients within them. It also means looking at other disruptive tools to block outdoor transmission. The tools we have today are really dealing with, mostly dealing with people when they're in their homes. But actually that is changing. Uh, and a lot of transmission is happening outside, particularly across Africa, but, but also in the Indo-Pacific region. And then if we're to be able to afford these tools, we've got to get the cost down, make them more effective, uh, and, uh, and be able to get the same impact with less active ingredient. And as something that everybody else is, everyone's becoming uh, to, to realize now is the idea of universal coverage, giving everybody access to every single intervention is it's not affordable, it's not feasible, and it's probably not necessary. And that means we have to have surveillance tools uh, and, and data-driven decisions. So, we, so in every geography, we know exactly what the issue is and what layering of interventions are going to be required to actually uh, have an impact. And then you've got these other, if you really want to eradicate, you've got to deal with things like last mile issues, which are personal protection, forest packs, mobile workers who are moving the disease around. And so you need these tools for very vulnerable urban settings. And there really isn't, there are tools, but we really don't know that much about whether they work. And the one that, worry, that I wouldn't say worries me the most, but I think the hardest to do, because science can be done, it just takes time and, and money and you, you can get there. But how do you get all the stakeholder community to collaborate, to do this together? How do the vaccines work with the, with the drugs, work with the diagnostics, work with the vector? Uh, control tools? How do we get the companies, each with different products, to agree to rotate their chemistries, etc.? And so last year, you know, we had a stakeholder meeting in Liverpool, in fact, we had 170 organisations join us. And so there is, a, there, there, there is an interest in, in doing it and getting it right, but it's not that easy to coordinate. So I talked about failed markets. Why, why are they failed? They fail because the, the innovation generally comes from agriculture, 
the number of companies that are actually doing basic research has shrunk hugely. Uh, and at the same time, the chemistries that they are producing don't really fit what we're trying to do uh, in, in vector control. And it's a tiny market compared to the pharma market and it, compared to agriculture. The cost to develop are probably the same. Companies don't get their money back. So it takes organizations and governments to, to, to fund and support the research within these companies. And it is kind of complex because one new active ingredient isn't going to do it. If you have one and you overuse it, you're going to have resistance. So you have to be able to rotate or mix chemistries for each of these types of interventions. And I'm sorry to be going fast, but I, I know we're running out of time. And so, so you really have to have more than one tool to do this. And this is another complex slide, but resistance isn't just one thing. Resistance is, is a whole number of things. It can be behavioral resistance. Insects avoiding an active ingredient when applied or metabolic resistance where, where the insect can actually break down, um, break down the insecticide just like it can break down other toxins. Or cuticular thickening is something we're seeing now where insects have stronger cuticles and that means they can avoid uptake of their chemistry. So there, if you map out all the different technologies we could use, there's loads of them and it's very exciting. But actually, that's, most of these products will never make it. And that is because cost, efficacy, um, safety, and they have to be scalable. You have to be able to manufacture them. They have to be able to survive in, 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 in harsh environments and they have to be very, very affordable. So you know, you've got great loads and loads of fantastic ideas out there, but you've got to be practical. Uh, they're not going to happen. So I'm going to rush through this, but just to explain, we have, we have three new chemistries right now in full development. Each one is going to cost about 50 to 100 million to bring through. Uh, but it took four and a half million compounds to get to this four compounds today. We started in 2008 looking at the chemical libraries of all these major companies. There are products that have come through and they are having impact as we've gone through the timeline. Uh, and Interceptor G2, for example, is a, a novel uh, dual AI net, active ingredient net from, from BSF that we co-developed. And now with the new active ingredients, we're working on dual active ingredient net mixtures so that we can keep these nets right the way through till eradication without resistance. And then you've got all these minor gap tools. What do you do with people who potentially can get bitten outdoors? Do repellents really work? What about bite proof clothing, etc.? Can you do that? So there are lots of additional technologies that we're looking for and some of them uh, actually not necessarily related to malaria, but other diseases like dengue. An ATSB is something you might hear about if, if you ever invite me back again. We can, we can do a whole session to talk about how might you be able to use the behavior of the mosquito uh, to actually take it to a toxicant where it feeds on the toxicant and dies and behavior associated with it, with the fact that, that mosquitoes need uh, sugars. Uh, in order to get energy and you can attract them to, to, to sugars in the environment. And we, we know that we know that some high potential that they work. And there's lots and lots of other things that you need to do to make sure that you get these chemistries out there. We, we have a new net design center now that, that, is, uh, that is working, just started in China and that allows us to take new chemistry, mix the chemistry that, and these chemistries have not been registered. So it has to be done in a safe environment so we can take them and use them in the field. Right through to a laboratory at the Liverpool School of um, Tropical Medicine with 15 resistant uh, species um, taken from uh, across the world. Or application technology, the equipment used to apply IRS is 70 years old. Can we do it more efficiently and more effectively? And then what, how about how do these chemistries work on the surfaces? of muds and, and, and nets. Can we improve the way that chemistry transfers from those surfaces to the insects? See, they're all things that get, have to go on in the background. So just a few slides on where we are um, uh, with, with, the, with the program that's funded um, by the Australian government. And uh, so we take all that and we agreed with, um, with, the, uh, with the Australian government that we would take some of the best tools and test them in the region. Uh, we wouldn't try and develop necessarily new tools. We would look for quick wins. That means product adaptation rather than full development. 
it's a five-year grant. We're, we're two years in, uh, and, uh, and we really want to see impact as much as possible. So it's adaptation of what's already out there. First thing we did, and you're welcome to go look at these reports. They're on IVCC's website. There's about 300 pages of this stuff. But what solutions do we need by, by country? What products? What are the regulatory hurdles? How do you get them registered? And then what are the access challenges? How are, how are they going to be paid for country by country? Uh, is it through, through the homeowner or is it through government programs? So, so there's no point in develop something if we can't deliver it. And what we learned that, you know, outdoor transmission is actually in this region is, is, is a pretty serious issue. Uh, that there's variable regulatory systems across the region, they're sluggish, they, they, they can take many years. Uh, there's an unregulated consumer market, some products are out there being used, they've never really been fully tested. And so there, there are quite a few challenges in the region, um, in, in many ways, more than we thought. And there are two projects, Project Bite, which is a, a, a real focus on Cambodia and Thailand, and looking at how do you deal with forest packs for um, mobile workers, outdoor workers, and anything we learn there can be applied uh, to um, the mobile population in other countries. And, uh, and the NatNat project, which is focused on Papua New Guinea, which is how, how, do we, how do we build a framework for getting these products tested? How do we build capacity and expertise so that we can run all the products uh, that we're operating on and working on uh, and other and, and actually other organizations doesn't have to be IVCC uh, and make sure that we can select the right tools for the region. Uh, and the other piece we're doing is, is, is again is modeling. So how do we how do these will these tools work together with existing tools by region, by geography? So this is my this is my last slide, and I just I only got it uh, this morning from one of my colleagues. He was telling me that I was asking about Rotarians in Africa. And uh, we are already working with, with uh, uh, Rotarian Malaria Partners and, uh, and, uh, and others um, in Uganda. And uh, the, what, we, what we, we have a program there doing indoor residual spraying. And I just, let me just focus you on what's in that red box there. Um, IRS in Uganda, uh, we, con we conducted the survey. Uh, we looked at we looked at bed nets using old chemistry, and then we looked at rounds of new chemistry, uh, IRS chemistry, with uh, in combination with bed nets. And you can see that um, uh, prevalence went from uh, 21 to 29 percent down to 3.4 percent uh, when we used a combination of of newer chemistry um, with even older nets. And if we could replace those older nets with the new technologies we think we'd have even more impact. So that's a, that's a crazy run through of all the things that a PDP like IVCC is trying to focus on. New technologies, do it quickly um, uh, and try and have impact as soon as we can and, and adapt those technologies um, to, to other regions like the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I have to say that working, working with the Center for Health Security uh, and the team there has been an absolute joy. Everybody in IVCC wants to work on this program because they're just such uh, enormously supportive people to work with. Uh, so thank you to them. I, I don't even know if they're on the line, possibly not, but um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's been great fun to be a part of this and be able to take expensively developed technologies uh, for that, that have, uh, in Africa and see how we can apply them to the Indo-Pacific region. So um, I hope you invite me back and uh, we can tell you what progress we're making uh, in, uh, in, in what areas and where we need help. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we have some questions. Um, so, sorry, got to find the first one. Where did it go? There, there it is. Um, so the World Health Organization has set malaria elimination by 2030 in 35 countries. Are products getting out to communities in good time considering the red tapes can be barriers to acceptance of new tools? Well, I'll, I'll quickly address that. I mean, I, I, I think uh, the Global Malaria Program in WHO has already said very publicly that there is, there is no way they're going to meet their 2030 goals. 
and uh, uh, and uh, we we can we can talk about why that might be, and we can we can talk about COVID, and, and clearly that is that's going to have an uh, an impact. Um, but it's more than that. It's just it's 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 trying to understand why we're actually seeing a flattening of the curve. Uh, and uh, what tools are required and how quickly we can get them to market. That work actually on, 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 four, on what happens if we were delayed four years was actually done to, to talk to regulatory, author regulatory authorities and so if you insist on epidemiology trials which take four years and cost 10, 15 million we don't have, what's the potential impact in that delay in, in how many lives could be lost? So encouraging new ways of thinking about um, about about rolling out of, of new technologies quickly, a little bit like we're trying to do, I guess, with a vaccine for COVID. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a, it's kind of a quick and simple answer. We, we're not going to hit those numbers. We have an initiative um, with industry called um, Zero by Forty. Our focus is to try and make a contribution to get to zero by 2040. Uh, WHO is not prepared to put a date on, on eradication, um, but the Lancet report I mentioned early on is, is saying that 2050 is feasible. In the end, it doesn't matter. You've got to have a goal to get to. Um, but um, I, I think the technology does have the potential uh, certainly to eliminate and, and we should go further to eradicate. Um, I'll go maybe one or two more questions, just uh, keeping an eye on time. Um, do we need to adopt a broader strategy for elimination from, of malaria, net spraying, but also vaccine and other research technologies? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think the days when, when people thought there was a silver bullet and there was one technology that was going to do all GM, genetically modified mosquitoes, for example, I think, I think smart, the smart smart folks are backed out of that and really really it's going to be kind of horses for courses we we, we need to understand the geography we need to un understand the parasite and we need to be selecting and layering the best tools uh, and that means that all the community the drugs community the vaccines the diagnostics the gm um, mosquito folks they all have to be all have to be working together so we, we don't do any modeling without considering what else is out there to make sure that, that we understand that, I mean, we don't want to spend 50 million on developing something that will come after another technology uh, and won't be necessary. We'd rather transfer that 50 million to somebody else uh, and, and get them to market sooner. So I think um, how we do it, I think is not, is not that straightforward. Um, you'd think it wouldn't be complex, but actually it is. Communities tend to work in isolation. But there are organizations uh, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that do have a strategy for malaria eradication and do have this sort of collective, holistic view of what technologies are coming through and when they should come, when they should come through and what impact. So they kind of have the ability to build a model of how all these technologies should work together to get us through to eradication. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll leave it there uh, for the questions today. Um, thank you, Nick, for your presentation today. You're welcome, thank you. The next speaker we have is Dr. Kevin Palmer. Dr. Kevin Palmer is a globally recognized expert in areas of malaria elimination, dengue and lymphatic filariasis. With extensive experience in program planning, project implementation, program assessments and management. He worked, has worked in Asia and Pacific and the Pacific for a total of 31 years at levels of malaria control right down to the village and household levels and with mobile slash migrant populations. In his 23 years of WHO, Dr. Palmer has worked at, a, at both regional and country levels, including nine years in the field, working with all eight national malaria control programs in the Western Pacific region. Today, he will be talking the next 10 years, progress and challenges of malaria elimination in Oceania, in Oceania countries. Please welcome Dr. Kevin Palmer. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 
Hopefully. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, this is this is the topic that Jenny gave me. Uh, I think it sort of brings us back maybe to a little bit closer uh, from Africa to Asia and from Asia to Oceania. Um, the simple answer to the question she gave me, by 2030, I think we'll see Vanuatu and Timor-Leste will have eliminated malaria and been certified by WHO as malaria free. As I mentioned in a minute, Timor-Leste should have done a long time ago and Vanuatu has also sort of been held up a little bit. But we'll talk about each country separately as we go along. And by 2030, Solomon Islands will have reached zero indigenous cases and be progressing toward elimination with a target of 2034. It was doing very well for a while, as we'll see, and kind of got a hit a bump. And third, Papua New Guinea, by 2030, it'll still be struggling. And this may not be politically correct, but may never achieve elimination, I'm not sure. It's got a lot of things that are in its way. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, first, Timor-Leste. If you see on the side here, this is a sort of history. It has a long history. It's uh, introduced nets. But basically, its problem is Okusi, this one sort of uh, area of Timor-Leste that's surrounded by Indonesia. This is the 2016 data that I'm showing you because that's where all the cases have been. They've had lots of cases in Okusi. And up to 2018, when we did the uh, malaria program review, that's where everything was. But they seem to have solved that problem. And so since 2018, they've had zero cases. So they put in a surveillance system in Okusi. They've been able to, to uh, locate and react to all the cases as they come up. And so they're down to zero. They should be going into elimination assessment or certification very soon. That means to go and the team goes and investigates and follows up on every single case to see if it's an imported case or it's from local transmission. Uh, I did that last in uh, Sri Lanka and it's a lot of work, but it shows that these countries are able to do what they need to do in terms of surveillance. The challenges going forward are going to be to keep the malaria-free status in Akusi. We'll keep finding imported cases for sure because the area around the, uh, in, in the Indonesia is not malaria-free. They're way behind Timor-Leste. So there's a constant flow of population in and out. And as long as the Timor-Leste uh, program is able to identify these cases and treat them and also provide bed nets, so that there's no transmission, secondary transmission, they'll be fine. So they really need to maintain a close collaboration and communication with Indonesia. And that's going to be their key to success. So Timor-Leste is basically there. Vanuatu, they're targeting zero indigenous cases by 2023 and WHO certification by 2026. Um, Vanuatu probably has been delayed by three or four years because of some technical problems. They still have cases in two provinces, which we found were due to basically the lack of mosquito nets. The cases still are in Malampa and Samna. Now we went to investigate why there were still cases there. And we discovered in the last round of mosquito net distribution that Malampa, they ran out of nets when they got up to the north. They started in and went clockwise. And by the time they got up there, they ran out of nets and nobody said anything. So they had big hot spots. They had like 900 cases in some of these villages in the north. The same in South Santo in this area, they ran out of nets and they had hot spots. So they've replaced the nets. And so by this time, they should be back down on the path toward elimination. This is 2019, so there's 4.9 cases and 4.2 uh, 4 cases per thousand. This is the annual parasite incidence. This is how we measure progress toward elimination. So they're there, and they're getting money now from the Global Fund, 
they should be getting uh, about uh, $8 million. They should be able to address some of their problems. So this is their timeline. So by this year, they should have zero cases in two, pro two more provinces, Panama and Torba, which is in the north, by 2022 in Sheffa, which is in the central part. And by 2023, these two problem uh, provinces should be down to zero. So it takes three years of zero cases before WHO will come and do an assessment and get certification. So by, if they can keep zero cases, indigenous local transmission cases, 24, 25, and 26, they can be certified. So again, the previous speaker talks about innovation. We need it, but we have to remember that Vanuatu, Timor-Leste, and Sri Lanka has been able to eliminate without new technologies. They've been able to use the same old ones we've had, which are kind of crude in many ways, but they've been able to put them together in the right way and make it happen. So it's, it's possible, but some places definitely need innovations. We need new, new technologies, new insecticides. So the challenges in Vanuatu a lot, it's a small place, but they've had cyclones, they have a very small program, a very short manpower, very small number of people. They, up till now, they had very short funding. That's why they ran out of mosquito nets. Uh, and their elimination ready surveillance system is still needed to be put in place. So key to elimination is surveillance. If you don't have a surveillance system in place, you're not gonna eliminate. And if you eliminate, you're not gonna be able to maintain it. So this is what we're talking about everywhere in Oceania, surveillance systems we've got to put in place so we can keep what we got. And the other problem is G6PD testing, which is a way of measuring this deficiency, which is allowed, well, you guys talked about this before, uh, yesterday, I think, p vivax treatment with tefenoquine, and you must have talked about G6PD then. So Venmato has a lot of challenges, but they're on their way, they'll get there. Now they've got funding and support from Global Fund, and from RAM too. Uh, the next one is Solomon Islands. Um, they target 2030 as zero cases. They were on track to get there by 2030 with certification, but in 2015, they sort of hit a bump and there's been a resurgence of cases in a few provinces. You can see they have a long history. They were started way up here on 450 cases per thousand and by 2014 they were down to 30, which is actually an amazing accomplishment considering all the things they've gone through, civil, uh, civil disturbances and all kinds of re reconstructions and political problems. But then you can see, I'll show you in a minute how it's gone up, but it went from 30 per thousand and in 2019, it was 107 per thousand. In 2020, it's probably higher than that. So they're stuck in an increase of cases. So they've really got to work hard to turn this all around. And so the new global fund proposal that's just going in is aimed at getting the funds that they need to do this. They've got two provinces, Isabel and Choiso, that already and they can go to elimination, but the other ones I'll show you in a minute are behind. So this is the, this is the curve basically. So 2014, they were down to 30, 2019, 107, and 2020, maybe 115. We haven't got the full data yet. But what happened, I think is the question. This shows you where the cases are basically. Uh, parts of Malaita, and Central Island provinces, and then Guadalcanal. Over in Isabel and Choisel, they're pretty low. They're almost, uh, they're very low, uh, less than one case per thousand. And if they're that, at that level, then they're ready to go for, the, for elimination. But these other provinces back here, Malaita and uh, Central Island provinces are holding them back. But I think the, the key thing is here, 67% of the population and still living in high transmission areas, which is because of Malaita and Guadalcanal. These are where the two population concentrations are. Central Island is a little bit less. 
but these are a big, so there's still a big challenge ahead for Solomons. I'm pretty sure they can make it if they can turn things around, but it's going to be hard. They have a small program, but they should be getting about $13 million from the Global Fund this round, which they can put into infrastructure and other things that they need to push them along. So the challenges in Solomons are, they recently had a decentralization of the Ministry of Health, which messed up everything. So there's delayed implementation of key interventions at the provincial level and at the field level. They have technical problems with their mosquito nets. They've had to replace the mosquito nets in 2016 because of the ones they got were substandard. They need to revive indoor residual spraying, which was stopped in 2015, which is a big contribution to the resurgence, but they ran out of money and they were having problems keeping the spraying a good quality. They need to establish a surveillance system. They haven't got one. They just have a paper system, which is slowly evolving into a online system, but they need to be able to find out where the cases are, where they came from and do something about them. And as with Vanuatu, they need a G6PD for PVIVAX. So I'm sure you've heard over the yesterday and today a lot about PVIVAX. It's a problem. It's the one thing that's going to hold back a lot of these countries because they're not able to fully treat VIVAX cases. Now, Papua New Guinea. Um, Tim is going to talk after me. He's going to he's going to give you the update on Papua New Guinea. So I won't be too detailed but to say only that it was on track to elimination prior to 2015. Papua New Guinea had done a really good job. If you see this graph, the incidence is what we measure, the blue line has come down from more than 300 per thousand in 2000, down to roughly 78 and 79 here in 2012. It had a bump and it's maybe in terms of COVID, it sort of flattened the curve, but there's still a lot of cases. Between 2012 and 2019, there was an increase of 521,000 cases. So the incidence has increased from 91 per thousand to 127 per thousand over that period. So they're showing the same kind of increase. I'll show you how it compares to Solomon's in a minute, but the same kind of resurgence. And it's really hard, at least for me, that's been working in PNG for a long time to see that they're gonna actually reach elimination by 2030. Even though in some of their more recent reports and submissions to Global Fund, they say they might make it for some parts of Papua New Guinea, but I'll leave that to Tim to explain. So Papua New Guinea, the challenges are basically a dysfunctional health system, a lack of drugs at facilities due to a poor distribution system. I did, a full, I did an assessment of drugs in the north coast in uh, Morobi province you know, two years ago, I went to health facility and found no malaria drugs, absolutely none. You go to some of the health facilities and you, one big health facility you went to, right on the door it says, we don't have any drugs. If you're found to be positive, you go to the pharmacy. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, health strengthening, that, system strengthening that needs to be done. But Papua New Guinea this time around, from the Global Fund will be getting $34 million, which a lot of it will be going into some strengthening of uh, distribution systems, uh, management systems. So there's a lot of, in, going to be a lot of investment in health system strengthening. But again, but the last thing is they've got a whole bunch of bad nets. This really threw them for a loop. I think Tim can talk about this too. But they, like Solomon's, got bad quality nets. And so they're going to have to replace all the nets in PNG with new nets over the next few years. Now, the one thing I wanted to point out was that this is they, the goals, the official goals of Papua New Guinea in terms of elimination are by 25 incidents to fall into 73 per thousand and by uh, and further to 25 per thousand 
But this, these are sort of fake news. 73 per thousand is a prevalence number from a, um, a one site where they call us a, a, what you call, a sentinel site. It's not what you call a number to evaluate malaria elimination. So this is prevalence 73 in one place, but the real number is more like 175 if you look at the whole country. But the good thing is it's close to elimination in Bougainville. Bougainville is almost down to zero and that will be followed soon by the other islands, the other island region. So by 2030, the islands, Bougainville will probably be down to zero. But what about the rest? The highlands, maybe you'll get outbreak, uh, stopping outbreaks in the highlands, but it's going to continue. So Papua New Guinea still has a long way to go, a lot of hurdles to, to jump before they're going to be able to reach any kind of elimination. This is the comparison. You can see uh, one thing that Jenny asked me to do, what, what are the similarities? The similarities are PNG had, we we're doing very well to 2014 or 15 and then starting to go up. The same thing with Solomon's. Different reasons, but still the same effect. And so that's why, as the previous speaker said, GMP is showing that malaria may be going up in some parts of the, parts of the region, but uh, there's still hope. I think in our part of the world, we're dealing with basically small populations, small countries, but still have problems that I think mainly can be overcome with the tools that we have. PNG might need more tools, but I think they can do it if they can get themselves organized, if they, the health system can support them. The other thing she asked me to point out, what are the elements of success? Which, what, what's happened to make things successful, like in Timor-Leste and Vanuatu? They have a strong health systems. If you have a strong health systems, then malaria is much easier to control and eliminate. You need to have high coverage with the mosquito nets, the long lasting insecticide treated mosquito nets. Bad coverage leads to cases. That's what happened in Solomon's. Low coverage, cases went up. Um, you need a good procurement and distribution system to get the drugs to where they needed, to get the nets out when they need to be out. You need strong technical leadership, good uh, WHO leadership at the country level good political commitment and a strong program management. In some cases, this program management is where things fall apart. We have tools that we can use, but if they're not in the field at the right time and done in the right way, then they're not gonna be effective. So program management is something we have to always concentrate on. Community involvement is something everybody talks about, but nobody seems to use. We're trying now in Solomon Islands to make communities fully involved fully involved in bed net distribution and IRS. They need to be active and they need to be on the ground every day. Next one is funding. Funding, uh, and I think now with this global fund, with this special fund that global fund is offering us money from, uh, this called the uh, Malaria Elimination in Melanesia and Timor-Leste, we've got extra funds to push us over the edge, over the end, uh, end game, let's say not over the edge, to the end. And so this is why Solomon's has got uh, uh, five $5 million extra. Papua New Guinea got 18 million out of this fund and uh, Vanuatu 4 million. So there's now gonna be funding, but the funding needs to be used properly and it needs to get down to the operational level. And finally, the donors and partners are key. Every one of our small countries in the Pacific, the donors make it happen. The partners make it happen. The, the health systems are small, the programs are small, and they need the donors and the partners to put them in place. Um, the effects of uh, COVID-19. There's a lot, of, a lot of concern that all the resources are going into COVID and they're going to be taken away from malaria. That's, that may be a valid concern, but in the Pacific and Oceania, PN, uh, except for PNG, COVID is not really a problem yet. Maybe it'll be a problem if we don't get a vaccine in time, but even when we do get a vaccine, we're gonna have it around. 
So we have to be careful and make sure that there's no major diversion of resources in terms of manpower diverted from malaria for planning or funds taken from other programs. There is some places where surveillance, which is the important part of elimination of COVID and malaria overlap in terms of contact tracing, which it comes down to the same thing. Who's sick? Where do they get it from? Uh, how can you control it? And when, how do you respond to it? So COVID is a concern, but I think we're in pretty good shape. Now, the last thing is what RAM can do. Number one, RAM basically runs the PNG program. Without RAM, PNG would be really in trouble. So RAM needs to continue pushing, putting good technical advice and good managers like Tim and the others to keep things moving. RAM can do a lot to support community involvement, especially as surveillance is coming up that needs more support uh, in all kinds of ways. And then the last thing, which is sort of key to what we're looking at in Solomon's support for key infrastructure, housing and sheds and other things. In the past, RAM has been a big contrib contributor to infrastructure in the Solomon's. They used to go and build houses and sheds all over the place. Now we've got money again from Global Fund to build houses, to build sheds. And so if Solomon's can get together with RAM, RAM can provide the technology and the people and whatever, and the Global Fund money can pay for the, for the materials. So you can stretch your funds that way. And this is something that Solomon's really needs. That was kind of fast, but I think it was in my time. And so thank you very much. And uh, I'm open to ask or answer any questions. I see there's a whole bunch of questions. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so we'll get into questions straight away. There are a few questions, so I'll see which ones I can do. Um, this one, um, will climate change affect the Papua New Guinea highlands? Uh, probably, yes. Um, the highlands are very sensitive. It'll, a small change in the temperature or the humidity in the highlands brings on a lot of malaria. We know that from the previous previous experience. Um, sorry, just scrolling down. <laughs> um, once zero indigenous malaria is achieved, how long should malaria elimination support be maintained to prevent resurgence of malaria? Three years or five years? And <laughs> what evidence slash experience? That's a good question. Everybody asks me, mosquito nets, yeah, but when do you stop? The answer is probably not for a long time. We don't know when you can stop because you've got to make sure that you, you can control any kind of local transmission because it's not going to totally eliminate malaria. It'll eliminate local transmission, but you still have imported cases. So there's a no good answer to that question. You've got to keep going. Uh, what's the efficacy of funding in getting dollars to the front line? There's a big problem in getting front, uh, money to the front line. This is one thing we've in the, in the new in the Solomon's grant we've concentrated on. We're trying to work with DFAT to um, put uh, financial advisors at the provincial level so that we can make sure that the funding flows from the central level where the money sits out to the provinces so we can get money to the operational level so they can do mosquito nets when they're supposed to and make sure that they can get uh, do the IRS when they need to. Right now, everything is sort of ad hoc. I think the same problem is cited in PNG in their in recent grant application, that they have problems getting the money to the operational level too. And um, might go one or two more. Um, can East Timor access some of this focused global fund money? Timor Yep. these benefits yep. in strengthening. Yep, Timor, I'm not sure how much Timor is getting. I've been trying to find out, but yes, they got their full grant and they're also entitled to the part of this $25 million pot of money, which was there for the four countries. So yes, they should be getting good, good, a uh, good hunk of money, this extra money. They're basically over the line already, but they need to maintain their, their, their malaria fees uh, situation. So yes, they've got money. The question was West Timor. West, oh, West 
Where's oh, Timor? I think what happened is it got um, cut off and then it was, yeah, so yeah. it's just at the bottom now. Yeah, so so my typo. Yeah, yes. no, West Timor is a different story. West, West Timor is not part of this additional funding. Um, the last time I looked at West Timor, they were, they were making progress, but they were way behind Timor-Leste. They're still, they were still having problems with hotspots the last I knew. Um, we'll leave it there for questions today. Just uh, curious, uh, keeping an eye on time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kevin Palmer. Okay, our next speaker today is Tim Freeman. Tim is the project manager of Rotarians Against Malaria, Papua New Guinea. He is a malaria specialist and has worked in malaria control in a number of countries, including Papua New Guinea, Bazaar, uh, Mozambique, La uh, Libya, Sierra, Sierra Leone, <laughs> Afghanistan, and Zimbabwe. Tim has worked in the RAM Papua New Guinea program since it received funding from the Global, Global Fund in 2010. The RAM PNG malaria program started with about 25 people distrib distributing nets around Papua New Guinea. It now employs over 100 people and it involves with, it is involved with almost every aspect of malaria control in Papua New Guinea. Tim is going to talk about RAM Papua New Guinea updates. Please welcome Tim Freeman. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back again. I did present to another RAM meeting about six weeks ago, so I apologize if some of you have seen uh, the presentation I'm going to make. Anyway, I just wanted to, before I start the presentation, introduce to you our new chairman, Rio Fioco, sitting on my right here. So, he's just waiting. so I wanted you to know that uh, we have all the political support we need on this side. So I'm going to go now and share the screen. But uh, Rio is very happy to be with us because his first, I think, last time he was in a RAM conference was about seven years ago, I think. So let me just share the screen, hopefully, and get this one here. Right, so I'm just going to put it on full mode, if we can lucky. If it's going to go. So just give me a minute while it loads up. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a very quick update of where we are in the malaria program in PNG. And um, hopefully I can quick get through this in 10 minutes when we are allocated time. Very, very quickly, must be stressed that we are part of a greater program. The leader of this program is the Malaria Control Department of PNG, of which we are their major partner. And as said earlier, we are in fact having our feet in almost every aspect of the program. So our first and foremost, since 2010, we've been involved in net distribution, uh, nets to household level, and we've reached every village in PNG every three years uh, to every corner. Uh, we have also distribution to, anti, anti, uh, to pregnant mothers and other groups such as school children. We have the most important aspect that's happened over the last few years is we have health facility supervision. We have about 14 guys that visit every accessible health centre in the country, which sadly is only about 70%. About 30% of our health centres are very difficult to reach. On top of that, uh, Kevin earlier mentioned going to Morovia. I hope it was more than two years ago because we we started two and a half years ago uh, distributing drugs throughout the country. I feel that the problem with drug shortages in the country is a thing of the past. As far as there is occasional drug shortages in the country, but generally speaking, between our health visit, our health supervisors, and us procuring drugs. For example, this year, Global Fund has actually paid for all the malaria drugs for PNG for this year. Starting in 2020, we have what's called a HMM program which is Home Management of Malaria. This was a program done in the past, and we have now start, we're starting to expand it uh, through about seven or eight provinces. We also finance the research through the IMR and actually through the malaria program itself. I'll come back to this. And then we have the last part, which is called Chasing Malaria, which is really a community-based program, which is funded very much by RAM Australia and RAM PNG together. So very quickly, this is where our funding comes from. 70, 70, practically 78% of our funding comes from the Global Fund. 
And this funds all the METs up to 60, 1,600 meters. It funds all the drugs, health facilities, su supervision, and all the costs for IMR. We also have a very important donor called the Gents Malaria Foundation, which sadly are leaving us at the end of this year. They've accounted for 19% of our funding, and they, have, and they have basically supplied all the METs since 2017 for all areas below 1,600 meters. So their loss is really quite a big loss to the program. We also have a, a, an organization called PNG Sustainable, which came out of the Octedi mine in Western province. And they basically now fund us for all the activities in Western province of the country on the Indonesian border. We also, of course, have RAM PNG in Australia, which accounts for about 0.6% of our funding. And then last, the funding basically from the Chase Malaria Program. And then we just had ExxonMobil come in with a very small amount. I'll just show you here, this, is, this shows you the, the actual amounts. It amounts up to 37,000. And I will say just uh, for 2021 to 2023, we've just been awarded a huge grant by the Global Fund of 37.5 million. But with the loss of AMF, basically, we end up to the same type of program that we are running in 2020. So there's been no actual increase. All right, this is a map. As I said, we go to all the health centers, all the villages every three years. We are in the areas at the moment, which are highlighted in yellow. We started off with Milan Bay, sorry, that's in the green color, but then we've been up to Enger, Chimbu, Eastern Highlands. We have just, just recently, uh, we at the moment, we are sitting in Morobi, in two districts, and in Madang. And for the end of the year, we have to finish off East Sepik and Sandown, which you can see in the, in the north uh, west corner. So as I said, we visit each of these provinces every three years, pretty much at the same time every year. And I understand when Kevin said about missing somewhere out, I get very angry when my guys miss something out and don't tell me. And you need somebody really to keep an eye on these things to make sure it happens. Okay, this is just a, a risk of the nets the last 10 years. And anyway, just at the bottom, you'll see January to March and April, June, uh, we've distributed about 600,000 nets in the last six months. And by the end of this year, we need to distribute about another 800,000. Uh, we have been distributing nets, about 150,000 nets to vulnerable groups, such as pregnant women. In the last two years, we've had no money for this. And you'll see that this last year, we've had practically no nets going out to pregnant women. However, we are expecting a massive shipment of nets to arrive this next month which will keep us going for the next two years. So this program has been resurrected. Just to give you examples of the kind of logistics that we have to do sometimes, and this is one of my favorite, I love these Russian, Russian helicopters. This is in the Dang province. And the only way we can reach some of these places is to actually fly in. And the helicopters are useful here because uh, in this area, all the uh, airfields have been destroyed by pigs and airplanes can't land there. Right, this just gives you an example of a typical distribution of village uh, where people are coming to collect their nets. Okay, what are the constraints? Our biggest constraint this year is, is really surprising to say this, but tribal fights still remain one of our major problems. There's one whole district in Western Highlands we have been unable to do this year. The same applied two years ago in another district in Chimbu. And it's really sad to see that in the 20th century, we still are unable to reach certain areas due to this. We've also had to evacuate a team from one area in Enger due to disputes between the locals and health staff. Fortunately, we managed to go back and things quietened down and finish off the job. But with COVID, we've had other problems such as half the pilots and mission companies have run away, well, that's probably a bad word, evacuated, uh, left the country. And so we've had a very difficult time getting air support. And this is also, uh, so this has slowed us down in some places. And also with COVID, we've had several situations where our guys have had to go into quarantine. But otherwise, I would say, I'm very happy to say that we've managed to keep going throughout the COVID period. And perhaps it's affected, we've got to be perhaps only about two weeks behind. Right, we have, uh, going back to health center supervision, we have people known as regional malaria coordinators. We have 11 of those, and we also support a provincial level of further seven provincial malaria supervisors. As I said earlier, they visit all, uh, they, all accessible health centers, but not aid posts on a quarterly basis, and their job is to supply RDTs and ACTs and make sure they're accounted for. We also monitor uh, 
how uh, where is being tested and treatment and try and give uh, supervision and on spot training and also very importantly supply we have an electro we have a, a, a national health information system so we try to encourage everybody to submit their records on time and in the appropriate format because the biggest problem with health information system is getting the data on time as I said, our major issues here is slow reporting to the health system. Communication with remote areas is very difficult. Uh, we do have an electronic health information system on tablets with health centers. It's already been operated in about eight provinces and this next year will be expanded throughout the country. So we will, expect, we will be working with the ENHIS to make sure this happens. The biggest problem we have is that probably 40 to 50 percent of malaria cases are not simply not recorded. We know this because if you look at the table behind, you'll see, for instance, in 2019, we distributed 2.6 million RDTs, but in the health information system, we only have about uh, 50, uh, only have half that number. So this is a massive challenge. Anyway, we visited all in the last six uh, in the last six months. We, uh, Sorry, in the last year and a half, you can see here all the blue areas where we've managed to visit, adhere to our plan of visiting every three months. We have three provinces where it is only at five visits, and sadly, Western province, which is a nightmare of a place because it's one province, but you can't travel from one part of the province to another uh, without going by boat or aeroplane. Very quickly, this shows you what we ordered in 2019 in terms of drugs. This is what we, uh, what we distributed, as I said here, 2.9 million RDTs and about 1.7 million ACTs. This is just gives a picture showing the stuff arriving here. So we deal with all the logistics of the stuff arriving. But fortunately, we don't deal with procurement it's done by the, ministry, uh, by the global funds. Ram is also managing the finances of IMR and NDOH and five studies being supported by global fund. We have a stratification exercise, insecticide resistance, and as Kevin mentioned, net quality, I'll come back to that. Malaria indicator survey, which has been done at the moment, where we look at how well we've achieved our targets, and also therapeutic studies of ACTs, um, where we test the, the, the resistance to uh, present ACTs. Also, for insecticide resistance, I can say so far in malaria vectors, we don't have any in PNG. So, comes to this next slide here. This is a slide we just published a paper in this in July showing that we are unique in probably all the countries in the world. We've had the same manufacturers supply our nets from 2007 to 2019. And what we've discovered, and it seems to coincide with the decrease in malaria, as Kevin pointed out, malaria decreased very rapidly from about 2007 to 2015. And we can see from this graph this is a graph showing the mortality of mosquitoes on the right hand side and the years. And you can see from 2007 to 2012, all the mosquito nets we found kill 100%. We've managed to go back to, we've actually gone around to villages collecting old mosquito nets. Some naughty people didn't take, never use their nets and still had them in their packaging. And we were able to negotiate to take those back. And we're able to test quite a lot of nets going, going right back to 2007 as they would be in their packages. And you can see a very, very substantial decline in the quality of nets from 2006. So while we originally thought that the increases in malaria were due to drug shortages, I think it's the other way around. I'm strongly believing now that the increases in malaria are results of very poor, of poor nets and the drug shortages are a result of the, popular, of the malaria cases going up. I'm, I would like to say we are now getting new nets for PNG. I'd like to say problem solved, but it's not. We're now discovering probably the new nets that we've been reach, receiving from two other companies are not much better than the ones we just lost. However, we have another brand of nets coming in for the last two provinces, and the data on this looks good. And I'm hoping that this will start to have an impact on nets. So I'd like to say that the, the increases in malaria in PNG are nothing to do with uh, with the lack of effort on our side or lack of nets being distributed. Very quickly, home bed management of malaria goes quickly. This is something we're very going into. Our biggest problem in PNG is access. Uh, you may not know this, we have seven road systems that don't connect. The only way effectively to get from one part of the country to PNG is by aeroplane. And secondly, 
we have to get there. We have, to many places you have to go by foot, several hours walk in some cases. So we had a program earlier in 2015, 16 and 17, where PSI was running a home waste management in three provinces, which collapsed really, was stopped because of high costs. But now this has been, we're now expanding this with based in the PHAs, which you'll think a lot lower. So we're now in seven different provinces. This year we've already trained about 551 volunteers in these remote communities who will work through their local health centers. Chasing Malaria program, this is, in, this is in my heart. We are basically trying things here that we haven't been able to do, get money from Global Fund. So we've been giving nets out to positive malaria patients to encourage them to come and get uh, treatment. We map all those positive cases. And the major part of the funds coming into RAM, from RAM Australia are going to working in schools for communities, trying to get, create school clubs to destroy breeding sites. We're also training teachers to test and treat malaria in schools. So it means that they don't have to go to long distances for health centers. And we also support things like World Malaria Day and School Malaria Prevalence Surveys. So this is just a map of Port Moresby, for instance. This shows us that most of the malaria cases in Port Moresby, for instance, are adults. And up until last year, I felt that we had almost no transmission in Port Moresby. However, data coming in 2019 suggests that in fact we do have now one or two hotspots happening in Port Moresby, which is a great shame. School program, uh, we've, had a, we've had been working in communities here with this Chasing Malaria program since 2012. We moved to several places, but at the moment, uh, I know time is short, uh, we're working in a place called Kariba, which has very high malaria cases, just an hour and a half outside of Port Moresby. So we're working with about seven schools there, trying to get these schools to destroy malaria in their, uh, in their, around their localities. The biggest problems we have is one of continuity, is that when we're in communities, whether it's schools or communities, they're very happy to work with us, but as soon as we go away, they stop working. So we are still trying, we're now working with another NGO and trying to see if we can make a more sustainable thing that, where programs become, this program becomes embedded in the schools and they do these activities, whether we are there or not. Um, yes, I said, we've jumped to working with a group called Skills uh, who are going to be working with us in future to try and improve this program. Anyway, these are just some pictures showing in the communities looking for larvae and trying to destroy these covering. Uh, we have been using some larvae sites in some places. We generally try to cover up breeding sites and we don't, we don't distinguish between malaria and other mosquitoes. We tend to tr try and kill all mosquitoes so that at least the teachers can have a good night's sleep without mosquito nets. And there's Dave Pearson, our old one, when he came here. And we can see all the kids out looking for water in a, in a local pond here. Sorry, Dave, I'm showing this picture again, but it's still a nice one of you. Um, yes, and said we've, as I said, we've trained 13 teachers in these seven schools. So all these schools now have an active treatment program in the schools. They're all long distances from the local health centers. So our job is to make sure to support teachers to make sure that treatment goes away. For your information, these schools have been having malaria incident, uh, malaria prevalence of over 40%, which is incredibly high, even by PNG standards, and very embarrassing, considering this is only one and a half hours outside of Port Moresby. But through this program, or, or through this and other interventions, I'm happy to say that malaria has been coming down. I just show you, this is when we did something in 2018. You'll see that one school had 64% of the cases that we tested, and these are asymptomatic cases were positive for malaria, which was a huge eye-opener to all of us. But I'm glad to say that this has now come down below 20% in many places. Uh, RAM has just supported us by buying two containers of nets, which have just arrived. We have had a program since 2007 where RAM brings in nets and sells to the private sector. They also use some of these nets to supply, for instance, positive cases here. So we're trying to resurrect this one I'm trying to make it a lot bigger. And now I've got the chairman here sitting next to me, twisted his arm to make sure if we can expand this program further. Because my idea would be have nets on sale in every district in PNG if we could do it. 
Here's a map quite a bit different from Kevin's. I think Kevin must have got his from WHO. But basically, this shows the, uh, the annual incidence. It went down. There was, according to WHO, a bit of a, 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 bit of a increase in 2012, which I'm not sure was real. But certainly from 2015 onwards, malaria has been increasing. And it doesn't look that 2020 will be any better. This is a map showing by province. And you can very clearly see if we take, we mentioned about incidents, we can see very clearly that uh, the autonomous region of Bougainville is particularly the south of the island has practically no malaria. As far as we're concerned, malaria has almost disappeared from the highlands. We have been having outbreaks, but these outbreaks have actually been at lower altitudes and we think because our nets have not been any good, they've stopped working after two years and we're finding huge increases in malaria after two years when our nets have been doing. So they're not, they're not the same nets as we've had before. Anyway, our major challenge is, our biggest challenge at the moment is to find a good LLIN. It see, what we, are, we have been testing quite a lot of number of nets here and we're finding the quality of these nets, despite WHO saying they're all the same, is very, very uh, different from one net to another. We're also trying, so I believe that once we find a good working net, uh, this will change. We are also introducing IRS, but uh, the Global Fund has said, please prove it works in PNG because we believe that IRS works against some of our vectors, but not all of them. So we are hopefully having trials next year. And we are going to try and have an elimination program somewhere by Bougainville. I think it is very doable there, but we need to have extra money to do this. Anyway, I leave this with my favorite picture that I've had over the last five years. This, show, this is on the Western, on the border with Indonesia, showing how we get our nets into the place. And it's generally the poor old ladies that have to deal with this. You can see the lady carrying a whole pile of nets on her back and the baby in front. But the reality is this is the only way we get to many parts of PNG. I just want to show you, as we mentioned, we did start with 25, we're now over 100 people. So it's a massive, it's a massive program for me and everybody else. Uh, and so this was taken our annual meeting this year. So I leave this and say thank you very much and hope I haven't overstepped my mark too much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, if you've got any questions for Tim, um, email them to Will and Will will forward them across to Tim. Um, I'd like to introduce and hand over to the RAM National Manager, Jerry, uh, Dr. Jenny Kerryson. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Tim. That was great. Uh, great to, um, can you all hear me? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, once again, thank you to all speakers from yesterday and today. Um, we've learned so much and always great to, to have an update from everyone and to learn new things. Um, I, I guess uh, we don't have much time, so what I might do is, is um, um, one of the things we need to look at, we're always planning ahead and we, we need to make sure um, we take into account um, the, the strategies that we have uh, and, and how do we work with them and how do we apply them uh, in the countries we support. So Rotarians Against Malaria, uh, um, we support um, five countries and uh, they are uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Timor-Leste and more recently West Timor in Indonesia. West Timor is critical to maintaining uh, zero malaria in Timor-Leste. So um, we hope we can uh, get rid of malaria on Timor Island. Now, um, before I um, go on uh, for too much longer, I'd like to thank, um, you know, sincerely our small team who put this together very quickly. So, Will uh, Knelson, who, uh, who has been uh, uh, a major force in all this, he, he uh, decided that we would do a virtual conference because our face-to-face -face was cancelled. Um, and uh, so three weeks ago, 
he proposed that we, we do a virtual conference and the tenure, who is a wonderful road director, PR, social media person, has, uh, has basically um, carried all this on her own, really. And, and she also has been tweeting in the background. So we've been making a lot of noises in the social media this weekend. Um, I also like to thank Rotarian Dr. Ivor Harris from Rotary Club of Kippering North Lakes in District 9600. He is from the RAM Scientific Committee and Ivor worked on the uh, speakers program initially. And, and then of course he had to cancel it because of COVID-19. Um, now, all speakers, we, we truly appreciate your time and uh, it's been a wonderful learning experience for all of us and for all Rotarians who are interested to fight against malaria. It, malaria is a terrible disease as we have heard this weekend from Shelley uh, who spoke yesterday who had malaria and, and her son also had malaria as a, a toddler. And then of course Steve's story, very, very moving and, and terribly, terribly sad. So what can Rotarians do from here on? We have a lot of work to do. Um, WHO, World Health Organization, has uh, proposed we, uh, that in the, in the next 10 years, we try uh, and eliminate malaria uh, from several countries. And if not em eliminate, then we, we try to reduce by 90% in contrast to 2015. Now, Dr. Nick Hammond, uh, has uh, given us an update and WHO or, or other Nick Hammond is suggesting from IBCC that maybe 2040 is a more realistic timeline. Whatever it is, as Rotarians, we have the social responsibility to, to, to carry on. And, uh, and I'm so pleased to see so many of us this weekend. We had 70 or possibly 78 um, People who registered yesterday, uh, we managed to raise a little bit of money through this, this weekend. Thank you all. Um, and my call to action to everyone today is that uh, if you don't mind, we would like to contact each and every one of you to see how you can contribute to, to, to help, in, help us eliminate uh, this disease. And it's not that difficult, really, when you look at Vanuatu is on the verge of, of reaching malaria elimination, uh, 0 0.9, I think, to per thousand. Uh, Kevin, Dr. Kevin Palmer has uh, shared those updates with us. So Vanuatu wants to achieve zero malaria by uh, 2023. So does West Timor, who apparently has 0 0.8 per thousand. Uh, in annual parasitic incidents. Um, and Timor-Leste is our star, of course. They've achieved malaria elimination and Rotarians Against Malaria was there since 2006 from past district governor Phil Dempster's time. And then of course, um, Dave Pearson, who uh, took, took hold of REM and, and led the charge against malaria. It's very much uh, a strategic, um, you know, working against malaria is, a, is to look at the strategies and how we can help our partners. So, um, so this, this conference, I would say, has been uh, very successful and much, much uh, to our delight, of course, because uh, we just didn't, didn't think how it would go, as Will said earlier on. We're very new to, to this virtual conference uh, method. Um, so I think I, I, I would like to end here with, with that uh, a repeat on the call to action. All Rotarians and, and, and people who registered uh, for this weekend, we would like to contact you to see how you can help spread the word. And, and um, um, I really uh, like to acknowledge um, Professor Graham Jones' message about a broader strategy. Um, looking at nets, all, all possible strategies, uh, indoor residual spraying. Uh, we know nets and indoor 
residual spraying did work for Timor-Leste, Vanuatu is using it, and now we hear that PNG is going to introduce that. So, uh, and of course, vaccine, it's a game changer. We, 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 we know that, um, and, and we, we will work together. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Dave Pearson, our immediate uh, national manager for RAM Australia. And uh, Dave was in, the, in this position that I'm holding now. Uh, he was uh, um, in RAM for four years, so a very long time. Um, RAM would not have survived or continued to progress without all these wonderful pra uh, national managers uh, before my time. <laughs> so they're critical. Uh, so Dave, please can you um, tell us about uh, RAM and, and rocks? We, without rocks, we know we would not be here today. Uh, and, and so we've been with Rock since 1978. So um, Dave Pearson, thank you everyone. Th thanks Jenny. Um, first of all, congratulations to the conference committee. Uh, I found that the conference was uh, wonderful. It was just, just, just as engaging and uh, informative as the face-to-face -face conferences. And we could do it from the comfort of our own uh, lounges. In my case, I've got it projected up on our large flat screen TV. So it's just like being in a, a lecture theatre and I've just loved it. Uh, so well done conference committee and well done uh, national manager, Jenny. Uh, terrific work. Um, Jenny's asked me to talk a little bit about the relationship with Rawks. Um, RAM is a, is a very uh, much favoured uh, national activity of Rawks. But what Rawks brings to RAM is the, uh, the actual regulatory uh, uh, compliance uh, issues. So uh, Rawks is a, a company limited by guarantee and uh, it has four registered charities. It's a registered charity in its own right. It also has the Rotary Australia Overseas Aid Fund, um, the Rotary Australia Benevolent Society, uh, for Australian projects and uh, the Rotary Australia Relief Fund. Uh, the Relief Fund is currently in action, um, just publicising a an appeal for the Beirut disaster at the moment, and that's what its purpose is: is to rapidly react to disasters, um, to to uh, take in tax deductible donations, and then distribute them to uh, actual uh, projects. Uh, and uh, so they are um, charities that are registered with uh, the Australian government through uh, the ACNC, through ASIC and the ATO. Now, uh, within uh, ROCS, uh, we have something like 520 individual projects that we're currently facilitating, and we have uh, four national activities. The national activities, uh, of course, RAM is, in my opinion, the most important one. Uh, you probably get some arguments from some of my fellow directors, but uh, we also have uh, donations in kind, uh, the projects and volunteers activity, and the communications activity. Uh, RAM is very much front of mind in that uh, we currently have uh, Bruce, Dr. Bruce Anderson and Dr. Jenny Kerrison and myself, who are both all closely aligned with RAM, all board members of uh, RORCS, and our current uh, national chairman, John McLaren, has been attending RAM conferences uh, since, uh, I think his earliest one was around about 2008. So he, uh, he's very, very familiar with the work of RAM and its historical progression to the activity that you see today. Um, RORCS, in a strategic plan has a vision to facilitate projects uh, by not only providing the regulatory compliance aspects and all of uh, uh, the other oversight, um, but to uh, connect uh, potential projects and projects with um, outside organisations and to curate the, uh, uh, the validation of the project and all of the audit requirements. Um, 
part of our, our uh, vision is to uh, increase the amount of external funding that can make projects go bigger and further uh, without every dollar needing to be raised uh, directly through Rotarians. So historically, RAM has raised most of the funds that we've expended through uh, individual Rotarians and Rotary Clubs and Rotary Districts, and also through partnering with the Rotary Foundation. Uh, and that continues to be a very important form of funding our projects. Uh, but as we've seen in the model that Tim has described at uh, RAM PNG, uh, extremely important partnerships with the Global Fund and the Against Malaria Foundation, and pleasingly, several corporate entities within Papua New Guinea have contributed to that important work. So uh, currently within RORCS, we are exploring ways of increasing that kind of engagement with external funders. I note that the vaccine project also has uh, managed to have the Australian government contribute a significant amount of money towards their project. And that's uh, very pleasing. And, and that's the type of external partnering that we'd like to see going forward. So that's the vision. Uh, Rock sits in the background and allows RAM to uh, get on with doing the important technical and on ground work that, uh, that we all appreciate. So again, thank you for an excellent conference and thank you to all the speakers and thank you, uh, Dr. Jenny. Thanks very much, Dave. I'll hand over to Sarah now. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for everyone for attending this weekend. Um, it's been really informative um, where we are with malaria at the moment. Um, and thank you to all of the organisers as well for putting this conference on. Um, you can stay back and chat if you would like to ask further questions. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.